Welcome to NWA Connie Corso's podcast, where we talk all things dogs. Hey guys, welcome back to another podcast, NWA Connie Corso, where we talk all things dogs. I finally got the man here, <laughs> Dr. Joe Spoo. How you doing, sir? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This has been a uh, long awaited. Been very excited for this one. Uh, uh, let's uh, start out by just telling you, giving a background on yourself. Okay. So uh, born and raised in Northwest Iowa, uh, went to school at Iowa State University, graduated, moved up to Northern Minnesota to practice and uh, realized that I didn't belong in the trees and I liked the open prairies and being able to see a thunderstorm coming across the horizon. Uh, and so I moved to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, probably uh, 22 years ago, maybe 21 years ago. And um, it was closer to home, but also probably the place on earth that I could practice on the most hunting dogs in one sort of location. And hunting dogs has always been my thing. And so I moved here and at the same time, uh, had it, as soon as I had graduated med school, I'd actually started gundogdoc.com. So I've owned that domain for about 25 years and used it mostly to kind of go in and out of the consulting world, working um, with athletic canines. So a lot of stuff in the nutrition industry, some of the dog training industry, while always practicing as well. Uh, about, I don't know, 15 years ago, the... Um, specialty of canine sports medicine became a thing at the time most of us that were interested in athletic dogs usually would get advanced education in the the realm of human performance and so at the time i was actually in a phd program in human performance nutrition when the specialty college was developed and so i scrapped the going back to school and getting a phd and went down the path of getting board certified in sports medicine and rehabilitation um, as I was on that path, I met my wife, who's also a veterinary specialist, and we had a, a practice here in Sioux Falls that uh, I grew from a one doctor practice to a seven doctor practice, a combination of general practice and specialty medicine. And we uh, sold that in 2020. We continue to practice there, but it's kind of freed me up to kind of explore this online forum and in and, and creating educational resources. Uh, in my area, predominantly the, the hunting dog forum, but really it's anybody that's passionate and active and, and passionate about their dogs is going to benefit from the information that I provide. Okay. Okay. And the gun doc, um, uh, website, that is a form that uh, teaches classes on specific things or how, how does it work? Yeah. So it, it's a little bit of everything. So it has a lot of the content that I've produced over, over the years. And so, um, we, as part of it, I put out a weekly newsletter, um, that usually contains a, a blog post. And so I usually try to provide fresh written content on the website once a week. Uh, and then we've been doing for the last couple of months, um, YouTube videos as well, once a week. And so the, the, the website, um, uh, has all of that information and content. But then in addition here this spring, I had launched a uh, field emergency and first aid course. So the things that I think that dog owners should be able to do uh, on a first aid standpoint um, to treat their dogs out in the field. Uh, some of the stuff I think you can treat and not have to involve a veterinarian. Other it's you're stabilizing to get your dog to a vet. And then it's the things to recognize that, hey, I need to get this dog to a vet right away. Um, and so we have that course on there. I also have a free course that is um, putting together a first aid kit. And so it's it's a course to, to put together a first aid kit for an active dog. Um, and then obviously we have some plans for some things in the future. I'm probably going to, the next course that we're going to put out is probably going to be nutrition related. Okay, cool. So um, you are active hunter too. And what kind of dogs do you use? Right now I have uh, an English setter in a, in a lab. Um, historically I've had Chesapeake's and then kind of my, uh, the dog breed that I'll never be without again is, is field bred English cockers. And so we have a, a situation in our house with a geriatric mean little dog that uh, uh, I acquired via marriage and she's got some senility issues in, in things that like a puppy would just not be fair at this stage in the game. So uh, right now we're taking care of her late in life and then we'll be adding a cocker puppy sometime here in the near future. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, Dr. Joe, uh, I just want to say personally, I appreciate you. When I found your content, I was like, wow, this is, you know, just a, you just straight across the board. You don't seem to bend. You just seem like you just go off <laughs> fact and I, I really like that so yeah i appreciate uh, that yeah and experience uh so I, I got some health questions 
Sure. Uh, now this is probably gonna be stuff you covered before, but my audience is a little different. We got game dog dudes for his uh, uh, hog hunting. Mm -hmm. We got uh, sporting dogs. We got all kind of people. We even got snake breeders in here. I saw. <laughs> 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 so it's I, I actually exciting. have a good good friend who's a veterinarian that uh uh he's into falconry and all that sort of stuff and i'll never mm -hmm. forget so the first time i was in vet school and, and went and, and did a uh, an externship with him and we went over to his house and he had this little kestrel in this room that i thought oh, that's a needy had caught this bird and was rehabbing it and there were all these tupperware containers lying in the entire room we were in and, and i was like what what the heck's in all these and he was a snake breeder and, and just tons and tons of snakes in that house yeah. and i i am not a snake guy <laughs> right 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 <laughs> me neither <laughs> or or a mouse guy <laughs> I, that's we we, oh, I, we live live uh in the woods along a river once in a great while we'll get a mouse in the house and there's times yeah. that i'd rather just burn the whole damn place down I'll and leave you. when there's a mouse in it <laughs> i'm sorry if you ever want to get joe break out a mouse <laughs> uh so let's talk about weight Okay. Visually, what should our dogs look like at a healthy weight? Yeah. So uh, if it's a thin coated dog, I like to see ribs. And I think that that's a, a thing that uh, people miss. You know, we talk about, you know, a lot of, even some of the guidelines that are out there, they'll talk about, you know, having a waist tuck and things like that. And I don't think that that's always a good measure because you get some of these dogs, particularly the bigger muscular breeds that, when they put on extra fat, they're going to get barrel chested. And so they'll look like they have a waist tuck cut, but it's not like they just have this huge amount of fat pad over their ribs. And so I like to see ribs. So if you have a, you know, a, a thin coated dog, you should be able to see the last two to sometimes four ribs kind of, you know, depending upon that dog's build. Right. So you got that, those fast athletic moving dogs, you're going to see more of those ribs. You know, you get a muscular, more powerful dog. You're probably just going to see two or three of those ribs. And so I like to see them you get a heavier coated dog, then you're going to have to feel. And so I don't want to have to probe to feel those ribs. And that's where, you know, some people come in and I'll say, Hey, your dog's a little heavy. And they're like, Oh no, no, you can feel the ribs and they'll stick, you know, their finger will be an inch or two into fat to get to the ribs. We don't want that. It's, you know, if you rest your, your thumbs on the spine of a dog and then lightly feel at about that level to the side of the dog, you should be able to feel the ribs pretty dang easily. Uh, and so I like a ribby dog. The other point, so, you know, most, the vast majority of dogs are overweight, right? So we talk about just being able to see the ribs, but as you kind of get into intact dogs and athletic dogs and working dogs, sometimes we, we have that discussion of what's too thin look like. And so the other point of reference that I use is, is the hip bone. So the, the front of the hip, as, as you're kind of going back on that dog, you can sometimes see the top of that hip bone, uh, which I think is okay, or feel the top of that hip bone. But what I want to see is what's behind that. And so if, if that dog is just ripped and muscular and so has great big thighs, you know, has good glute muscles, and you can see the, the top of that hip, I'm fine with that. If we get to that hip and it dips down where you can kind of see the depression of the hip bones, then, then you have a dog that's probably too thin. And so I kind of feed to those two points on a dog. If, if the, you know, we start getting too ribby, too hippie, we need to up the food. If the hips going away and, and the ribs are going away, then we need to decrease the amount of food. Gotcha. Okay. And, um, what is, uh, we have a lot of debate on, uh, how to worm our puppies and things like that. What does, what do you recommend for the worming schedule of newborn puppies, uh, and, uh, and adult dogs? Yeah. So I think, you know, a couple of things. And so I don't get, let's back up. So part of it's going to be kind of take care of that bitch as much as we can before we even have the puppies. I think one point that some people miss is that, so even the cleanest facilities in the world, puppies and parasites kind of go hand in hand. And there's times that if that bitch was exposed to parasites earlier in her life, some of them can become insisted in the body. So her fecal might be negative, but then she gets pregnant. The stress of pregnancy will kind of cause those things to start cycling again and so you know i think having it be a whole life approach is important um and then and then maintenance of of the kennel so keeping track of fecal uh exams making sure that if we bring a new dogs in you have visiting dogs that we're staying on top of that i, I have a, a number of breeders in the area here that are pretty neurotic about that that making sure that any dog comes on their property for any period of time you know has a fecal exam we we don't have the resistance in the you know i don't think fecal parasites are as big of a deal up here as they are down south and so i think you know you guys have a whole different 
you know, battle that I'm not used to fighting. And so it's, it's one that I think it's, it's the other important point is to know that there's not a one warmer that's going to get everything. So you do kind of have to know what you're battling. And so a lot of times, you know, my generic recommendations is with those puppies is, you know, we'll use things like pyre and tail, something that's a, a, a fairly benign warmer. And then more specific, if we diagnose a problem, I think, you know, the big thing is, is trying to decrease overall worm load. But most importantly is once that dog is out of the litter, running a fecal sample and then treating that dog for what it potentially has. Oftentimes, you know, to me, kennel management is different than individual dog management. So I think you have, you know, the, the trying to aim it at the kennel, trying to decrease sort of loads. But then once that puppy, even if it comes from a facility that's been using dewormers, you need to check a fecal sample on that dog. And, and so typically what we'll do is, is, you know, the general recommendations are, you know, warming that dog for like round worms because of the potential human impact every two weeks for three doses. And so like a new puppy that I get in the clinic, we might give a dewormer at the first visit and then have them give the heartworm preventative in two weeks. And then we'll do another deworming in two weeks or we'll do the heartworm preventative, the first dose at the first visit, then like a dose of pyrantel in two weeks. And then, you know, the heartworm preventative again at a month. So it's being strategic with it. But I think, I think the, the part that gets missed the most is identifying what we're fighting, right? So it's, it's, we want to just kind of have a deworming program, but one, you could be fighting ghosts and maybe we don't have to go overboard because there aren't parasites or two, we're not treating the right parasites and making sure that, that, um, our interval is correctly, you know, so round worms are going to be different than hooks are going to be different than whips and the timing of those subsequent doses is important. And so I think it's, it's, it's a long blithering answer to, I don't have a set program because I think it, you can't, I think right. you, to, to be able to, to break the cycle, you have to know what you're fighting. And so, you know, if I treat with a broad spectrum dewormer, at round worms, I very likely am going to miss some of those other parasites with how the adults emerge and things like that. Cause most of our treatment is, is killing the adults. Right. And so if you have, you know, part of that cycle going on in the body, that's, that's basically not getting hit with the deworming by the time that emerges, I need to hit it again at that time. And, and by doing it, say every two weeks for three doses, I might miss some of those longer cycling worms. And so it's, it's important to know what you're fighting, I guess, is what I would say as, as the most important point. Right. Is that the, does it also apply to the vaccinations? I know certain areas have certain different things you fight. And so you should know these things for to a certain degree, as far as what products that you're using. And right. so, you know, if we talk like general, what every dog should be getting when we start talking vaccines, it's, it's the thing that has changed is that like early in my career, it was three doses, you know, it was, you know, we get them with three doses, three to four weeks apart, they're good to go. And what we have found is that's not necessarily true, particularly if as breeders, they're giving them super early. So, you know, if you have a breeder that gives a dog uh, its puppy shot at six weeks and then we booster at nine and at 12, what happens is, is that these vaccines have gotten really good. And so mom gets a tremendous level of protection that when those puppies are, you know, in their first 24, 48 hours of life, take that colostrum, they take in a bunch of mom's antibodies. And when they have those antibody levels are high, they can't actually mount their own response. And so over time, those antibody levels uh, fall in that puppy. And there's going to be a window for where they're susceptible to the diseases, but yet their body can't formulate that response yet. And so that's why we have this boostering window, because we don't know exactly when we're going to fall below that line. And we're going to also have that little window where they're susceptible to things like Parvo. And so what we now know is that most of that protection maybe lasts beyond that 12 week mark. And so it's no longer three shots. What we say now is we should booster or we should vaccinate those puppies every three to four weeks with the last vaccine coming at 16 weeks or later. And so it's more of a, you know, when we end as opposed to how many we give. And so, you know, I think that the days of a lot of breeders given, you know, vaccines at six weeks of age or earlier, I th they're kind of pissing in the wind a little bit, not, not maybe seeing any sort of benefit. I, you know, if we want to minimize the number of vaccines, I'd probably wait a little bit longer for that first one, you know, and maybe do an eight, 12, 16 week type of, of scenario if we only want to do three. But it, what we have found is that it's the, the end timing is the most important. And if we quit too early, we'll have susceptible dogs. And so it, it's, you know, we, we, we see parvo and dogs that, you know, are technically people thought fully vaccinated, but mm -hmm. they were just vaccinated too early and, and didn't actually get that protection. So it's, it's really a timing thing 
from an endpoint with vaccines. You touched on Parvo. Is it a new strain of Parvo? I think that is kind of highly variable, you know, parts of the country. And so like when I first started 23 years ago, we would lose dogs regularly to Parvo. Um, I mean, it, it's, I'll never forget. I had a, a, a three-year-old intact male Rottweiler that came in just this rip, like picture a health dog that had Parvo. And we thought, well, this dog will survive easy, right? We hospitalized it. I think it was day three or four. Everything was looking great. And uh, he just circled the drain and died within 24 hours and so wow. it's it's early in the career that's what i was used to parvo being that it killed dogs in this part of the country i don't remember the last dog that our clinic has lost to parvo and it's not that i think treatments have you know gotten infinitely better and we have you know some secret magic bullet that we use i think at least here it's maybe not as severe and so we hospitalize these dogs we still treat them the same and most dogs survive where I think in other parts of the country that that's not the case. And again, I think you start talking, you know, the difference between the North and the South, as far as weather and parasites and things like that. So if you have a dog, you know, in your part of the world that maybe also has a resistant intestinal parasite, you couple that with parvo, that dog's response to treatment is going to be different than a dog in this part of the country that maybe doesn't have intestinal parasites in, in, in a different, you know, whether it's a strain or things like that. So I, I, I think there's, confounding factors that go into the severity of parvo i cer certainly think there's probably different strains but like here uh, you know my experience has been that it's actually lessened over time where i just don't feel like these dogs get as severely ill and die like they did earlier in my career right right i want to know your opinions on uh, meds not being readily available to the public like they used to be yeah is, is it a good thing or is it it's a, a good thing? thing no it's a good thing we we see we see a lot of horrific resistant infections and so it's it's one that i think you know i'm old enough that you know every diarrhea case we used to throw metronidazole all that every skin infection we used to throw cephal you know like almost like candy right and like i used to advocate you know with my hunting dog owners to here's the meds to go in your first aid kit uh and, and i don't do that anymore there there are certain dogs that we know that have problems that that you know i will dispense those or if i have you know somebody that's going in a very remote place um you know i have a client that that has a a cabin in uh rural washington state that they they you know go by boat up into canada that's going to be a client that i'm going to send some antibiotics with but i think it's it's one that we're seeing very resistant infections in very young dogs as well and so i have a a, a shepherd in the practice that came um it had had a fracture that was repaired, end up with bone infection and ended up having the, the end of its paw amputated. And it, they, they thought it wasn't healing. They came to me to have a, a either a prosthetic or some type of device made to protect that area. Um, and so I cultured it and I mean, it was resistant to everything. Like I don't have but one option with an oral medication to use in that dog and it's 18 months old. And so it's, you know, it's already colonized with a bacteria that like, I don't know if we're going to be able to get in front of that infection. And so we're using a combination of topicals and other things, trying to save the use of those, those oral antibiotics. And so I, I think it's a huge problem that, that, um, I don't want to say I poo pooed, but that I thought, oh, we're maybe making too big a deal of this, you know, 10, 15 years ago, but I think it's, it's a real issue with resistance. And I think my view on that has changed too, as, as we've got, you know, had kids and younger kids. And I think, man, what's going to be available to treat them if they get one of these nasty resistant infections in 10, 15 years. And so I think it's, it's having that, that view to the future that sometimes, you know, in the moment we don't see, you know, I, I grew up in a time when you get cigarettes out of vending machines and we didn't wear seat belts. And, you know, the idea of both those things right now, you know, seem ludicrous, but I mean, that's what it was when I was a kid. So. Sure was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Let me, um, I heard you talk about, uh, dogs jumping out of stuff and shoulder injuries and things yep. like that um and another big topic is uh in our since we got a lot of us run bigger dogs is the joints what is your thoughts on ofa pin hip and is some is a uh, one thing we always uh, caution about is slippery floors stairs what are your thoughts on all these sure okay so let's start start with the jumping off of things so i think 
you know, especially with big dogs, what we worry about is a couple of things with jumping down. It's both the elbows and the shoulders. And so it it's one, especially when a dog is young, uh, you know, when we talk OFA, you can OFA for elbows and things like that. And we'll see dogs come in with one elbow jacked up, right? So it's, is it is it a genetic dysplasia issue? Or is it potentially when that dog was developing, you know, it jumped off a retaining wall or out of the back of a guy's pickup. And so I think jumping down out of things, particularly with the young dog is, is super important for the elbows. And so keeping those dogs from, from jumping off of things early in life. Uh, I think we probably don't stress enough, you know, especially as that dog gets bigger, sometimes it's a pain to lift them up, you know, out of the vehicle and, and they're raring to go. And so you open the crate and they bail out and jump off. Uh, but I think that the, the facts exist that, that it, you know, is responsible for a lot of the elbow issues that we see the shoulder is more of an overtime sort of thing. And so that repeated trauma of jumping down, particularly if a dog is overweight is where I think we see the shoulder issues. Um, and so the, and then with active dogs, if they're out running, say like a hunting dog, or, you know, like you talk about hog dogs running through cover where they're constantly kind of having that irritation to the shoulder. Um, and so it's, it's one that, that, you know, just being conscious of, are we causing undue stress on some of these joints is, is that, you know, are there things we can do to, to prevent potential issues. And I think jumping down out of vehicles, jumping down off of high things is, is an important thing. Um, backing fully up to weight. I think the other part of it is, is, you know, building that canine athlete, right. Or that end dog that we're going to have is how you feed them in that first year. And we can kind of, after we talk about joints, we can talk about that a little bit, but not having a dog that's overweight or a dog that yo-yos. And so, you know, you had a dog during peak athletic season, he looks great. And then kind of in the off season, he gets a little bit fat and then he gets, you know, back and, and going that back and forth. I think that's a lot of undue stress to these joints that we don't appreciate. And what happens if you get a dog with joint problems down the road is you can't unwind that, right? So I can't go back and say, well, you really screwed up, you know, what you did the first 18 months of the dog's life or jumping, you know, down out of your truck. And so it's, it's being conscious of these things that have a cumulative effect. When we start talking about like certifications, OFA, pen hip, um, it, 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 it's, I think there's no doubt that pen hip is probably the better system because it's a measurement type of system. The problem is dependent upon each breed. And so like, you know, early in my career, that, you know, I have a lot of German wire hair clients in the, in the practice and very few German wire hairs early on had had their dogs pen hipped. And so we could watch over time as those recommendations kind of shifted on pen hip because it's, it's the, the breeding recommendations are based on total numbers. And so if you have a very small gene pool or a very small number of dogs, pen hip may not be the most accurate in, in, because we just don't have the numbers. You know, you start talking about dogs like Labradors and golden retrievers and, and some of these, you know, breeds that have a bazillion numbers, those numbers are going to be pretty accurate and aren't going to shift over time. Um, and so, when, you know, we start talking about some of the dogs that you guys are, are running. There's not, you know, not everybody in town has three or four of them, right? So there's not a lot of them running around out there that are going to be pen hipped. And so I think, you know, being conscious of what those numbers say, if you have a, a breed that has small numbers, I think is something to take in light. But I think the actual system pen hip is better because you're actually taking objective measurements of that dog. And so, you know, OFA is just a one-time view, right? You were laying that dog on the table, we're, we're rolling those hips in. I think, you know, how we manipulate the hips can affect that because you're, you're, you're kind of, as you're trying to get that perfect image, you're kind of pushing the hips into the joint, right? Where with, with pen hip, the dogs are fully under anesthesia. They're laid on the table. They're put in a distractor and we're doing the opposite. We're trying to pull those hips out to see, you know, is there distraction there? And so it's, it's one, I'm not saying don't do OFA. I usually encourage people to do both because, you know, a lot of, a lot of clients and purchasers are going to be familiar with OFA and not necessarily understand pen hip. And so I think that, you know, there, there's reasons to have both. Um, I think OFA, uh, this might not be a popular thing to say, but I think OFA is, you know, there are things it's good at, but I think there's things where it's just collecting money to, to have a database and, mm -hmm. and maybe some of the, the information they're collecting may not be as impactful as we think it is. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, cause you can have OFA certification for a number of things. It doesn't mean that, that 
it's impactful. I think hips is still something to take into account, but I think I'd like to see over time if we shift it to everybody doing pen hip as opposed to everybody doing OFA and a few people doing pen hip. Right. All right. right. I, I blithered on for a while there. <laughs> no, no, no. Do it. We need it. <laughs> yeah. Everybody in my channel, they big learners. I got a, like a solid, really well, faithful few, like a 300 that's really in the learning. So, yeah, you could have your way. <laughs> uh, so um, let me ask you about this one, which I've seen you answer before, but spay and neuter. What are your thoughts on that? Because in our world, Dr. Joe, we have to be careful with the vets we go to. Sure. You know, uh, we call them breeder friendly, friendly vets. So that's why I want to know your thoughts on this. And, yep. uh, okay. So I, I literally, before we jumped on, uh, I'm in the middle of starting a series on this very subject. Um, in the first, the first video that I'm going to do is, is kind of addressing your point is how did we get to this point in the veterinary profession? Like why do vets have such a, like you have to spay everything at four to six months. And so that that's going to be the first video I do, because I think there's a lot of fallacies out there about it's ingrained in the profession, right? So like, it's not something that, that, you know, we just came up with last week. It's you're talking generations. We've, thought that it was in the best interest of these pets to spay and neuter them early for longevity. And so there's kind of three big pots that, that I like we've hung our hat on as veterinarians in that we've been told and believed both on like experience, but also on research that existed or that we thought existed. And so those kind of three big things are, and, and I'll kind of, I'll, I'll do a quick summation and then we'll kind of get okay. to, to your point. So in the video, I'm going to talk about the big one being pet overpopulation, right? Like, oh, I think we all as dog lovers would say that we hate the idea that there's dogs that, you know, are euthanized in shelters. And so we, we've hung our hat on years that, you know, we're helping with pet overpopulation. You know, those of us that grew up, you know, and even today, you know, the, the Bob Barker, have your pet spayed and neutered. I mean, even in popular culture, that's a thing, right? Like, let's let's spay and neuter everything. When we actually step back and look at it, though, of the dogs that are in the shelter that are purebred dogs, it's it's a small percentage. Like it's like I think some of the numbers I've seen are like five percent. And so it's not that these dogs are even coming from, say, irresponsible puppy mills. They're usually not purebred dogs. And so that message to spay and neuter everything being promoted to the clients that are actually seeking regular veterinary care is kind of a, a moot point, right? Like that responsible pet owner isn't likely the person that's causing the pet overpopulation. And so I think, I think we've been trumpeting a message that is falling on the wrong ears, right? You're, you're, we already have this group of people that love their pets. If they're coming to a veterinarian, they're likely not the source of this pet overpopulation issue. Um, and, and so I think for a long time, we've kind of focused our efforts there, but I think incorrectly when we step back and take a look at it, it's, it's not the responsible pet owner that's causing the pet overpopulation. Then the, the, the next big thing is behavior, right? We've all heard that, you know, I have a stack of, of books back here, some of them canine behavior books, and virtually in all of them, for almost every behavior problem, one of the first recommendations is to spay or neuter the dog if it's not spayed or neutered, because we assume like things like testosterone cause aggression and those sort of things. And, and when we look at the studies again, with testosterone, particularly in the male dog, where we see testosterone effects are like inner male aggression, mounting, marking, and, and be, you know behaviors like that. I think with overall aggression, that testosterone does cause the reaction to be quicker, but it's probably more of a training issue and a behavioral issue that wasn't addressed. So it, it's not that the testicle suddenly made this dog a jerk of a dog. It's probably that it was a jerk of the dog and maybe the testosterone just makes him a little bit more of a jerk but by taking off the testicles you still got to train the dog to not be a jerk and i think that's a part that gets missed and so when we look at the studies with those particular behaviors if a dog's neutered after six months of age it has no effect on those behaviors and there's actually some studies out there that show that there's behavior problems like anxiety and other issues that occur when a dog is neutered and so it, it's one that from a behavior standpoint for years again we've trumpeted this thing but now that we're doing these studies we're finding out that maybe our information is incorrect in that that there's actually some negatives associated with spaying and neutering that we hadn't taken into effect
Mm -hmm. The third category that we've trumpeted is the health reasons. And so, you know, with females, it's been pyometra, which is a pus filled uterus. And, and that is a real issue. So the, the first dog that I ever owned, um, she's still probably the biggest uterus that I've ever taken out of a dog. I mean, that thing, she was a 65 pound Chesapeake. And I mean, her, her uterus was huge. Each horn was, I mean, huge. Like when we opened her up, I was like, holy crap. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a real issue and, and dogs that are left intact, particularly dogs that aren't bred have somewhere probably between a 25 and 50% chance of developing pyometra. And so I think, you know, what I think with the female dogs, and we can kind of talk about this more is that we know maybe the early spay isn't the best thing, but like for those people that aren't going to breed at what point then do we spay to get kind of the maximum health benefits? without some of these risk of pyometra. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we, we trumpeted was that, you know, spaying a dog is going to decrease the risk of mammary cancer. Um, and that was based on a study in 1969 in, in, but we still use that study in veterinary medicine. And, and we talk about how a dog spayed before the first heat has a 0.5% chance of, of breast cancer before the second heat. I forget what it goes up to, but those those numbers have been kind of misquoted throughout the it have been changed over history it's not that she has a 0.5 percent chance it's that she has a 0.5 percent chance of the chance that a, a dog left intact does so if we say you know that's that that a dog left intact has a 10 percent chance this dog still has a 2.6 percent chance it's 0.5 percent of the overall number not a 0.5 percent so it's not zero what we're finding out on that front too is that you know that was one isolated study in 1969 when when we take a look at uh, you know it's particularly like the european countries where they don't necessarily require spays and neuters and things like that those rates maybe aren't as concrete as we base our recommendations here in this country and now what we're finding is that there is increased risk of a lot of other things right so on the you know the health front there's cancers that can develop longevity issues that can develop and so it becomes a picking your poison, poison, right? Like if I owned a, a golden retriever, would I rather have the chance of her having a mammary tumor that I could remove and not, you know, end her life? Or do I spay her and increase her risk for hemangiosarcoma, which is a non-treatable cancer? And so we're starting to learn some of the ramifications of spay and neuters. And, and on the male side, we always thought it was to help with testicular and, and prostate cancer. And what we know on the male side is that neutered males have a four time increased risk of prostate cancer and so I, I recently did a uh, a video on youtube on, on two male dogs that happened to come into the clinic on the same day both of them for prostate issues one was neutered as a puppy and one was still intact the intact dog just had you know benign prostatic hyperplasia with the prostatitis we, we did uh, meds and antibiotics and that dog's fine the dog neutered as a puppy had prostate cancer and clearly is not going to be fine. And so it's one that even veterinarians will say, oh, we need to neuter to protect from prostate issues. And, and, and that's not always the case. And so you have, you know, basically since 1969 as a profession, kind of these three things that we've been taught somewhat that have been proven to be incorrect. And so a lot of the the research showing this has come out fairly recently. Like we're talking the last, you know, five to 10 years at most, where we know that say spaying and neutering in certain breeds is going to increase the issue of joint problems, is going to increase the issue of certain cancers. And it's somewhat breed dependent. And so there are things that like with a golden retriever, we might increase their risk. But when we look at the Labrador, which you think would be a very similar dog, those same risks aren't the same when it comes to some of the cancers and things like that. And so we're getting some very specific knowledge now. The problem is, is it isn't pervasive throughout the entire profession. And, and it's going to take time um, to, to kind of get to that point, kind of like your antibiotics question, right? Like there's stuff that we get so ingrained in our minds and practices in this world that that it takes forever. It is just not a it's 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 like steering a big ship as opposed to steering a race car. And so we have you know, 50 years of a profession saying, this is what we need to do. And now we need to change that conversation to say, Hey, we've actually been wrong mm -hmm. and we need to have this individual conversation. And so it's not, you know, there, there's still the vast majority of people are going to be 
better served probably in their life having a spayed or neutered dog. I think the problem is, is that we can't say, okay, so let's just still do those at four to six months, particularly as you start talking large breeds. I think we're going to have to have individual conversations and say, okay, for this dog owned by you, you know, and you're not going to be a breeder, let's still keep them intact till two years of age or after a first heat cycle or, or, you know, whatever that ends up being. And so it, there's going to be a shift coming. It's just that, that, that the information and studies aren't, it's just not in the general vet knowledge base yet. It just hasn't become an accepted part of that discussion. And so it, it's, it's coming. I think there will be a shift, uh, but it's, it's going to take, you know, it might take our lifetime, right. Before it becomes that, that we're actually having these discussions like we should, because new information is coming and it's not, you know, I think part of the problem going back to your original about finding, you know, breeder specific vets, I think that, you know, since the beginning of time, a lot of young veterinarians are intimidated by people in the dog world, whether that's, you know, show dog people, agility dog people, breeders, hunters, whatever it is, people who are active with their dogs because they're knowledgeable about their dog. Right. And so it, it's one that like, I've always enjoyed that clientele better because I don't have to have the basic talks, right? We can talk about the stuff you're actually coming to me for. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, 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 it's just a shift that has to happen uh, in the profession where we say, Hey, maybe these guys are actually, you know, onto something and, and we need to have conversations as opposed to just being dismissive of each other. Um, because I think the other thing that happens sometimes too, is that you'll have, you know, I'm gonna call them breeder friendly, but breeder friendly veterinarians that sometimes will, skip on the advanced medicine side of things as well. Right. And so they're just like, okay, you know, you're, you're just looking for the quick and easy answer. And so here's your quick and easy answer. And also not having those more in-depth conversations that might improve what you're doing. And so you're, you know, you're trading one evil for another evil potentially, and not in all cases, but it, it's, it's, I've seen that happen as well, where, you know, have people who are really into their dogs, you know, and they end up going to a cow veterinarian just because they don't get hassled about what they're doing you know, f with their dogs. And so, but their dog's not getting the best care possible in that situation either. And so it's, it's, it's finding that person that understands what you're doing, but is also real knowledgeable about dogs. If that Facts. makes sense. Facts. Cause, uh, a lot of the, uh, the advice in our world go to a farm vet <laughs> exactly exactly you know it's so. cheaper and easier but it's not always the best route you know it's no different you know i haven't touched a cow in 25 years so you know yeah. I, I have the license to do so but you know someone showed up with with a cow they'd be in a world of hurt showing yeah, up yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. i understand that um i'm finna load up on this question i'm fixing to that's my southern um Pyometric, could you give an expl explanation of yep. what that was or what so, that is? So a female dog is unique in that she thinks she's pregnant every heat cycle. And so most animals, right, like they'll, they'll ovulate. And if they don't get bred, the body's like, cool, and we'll just move on with our life. The bitch is unique in that when she ovulates, her body thinks that she's bred, whether she is or not. And that uterus acts as an incubator for the, you know, call it 62 days, 63 days with with an unbred animal maybe that false pregnancy extends out to 70 some days and that's why you know especially like when a bitch goes through her first heat you know you think it's over and then like two months later she'll get the huge mammary development and you'd be like holy crap is this dog bred like why is that and it's because her body thought it was bred whether it was or not and so over time what happens particularly in a dog that's never been bred is that the lining of that uterus will increase its secretions it gets more billowy it, it wants to grow puppies and and so it becomes this perfect environment and if we get bacteria that get in there instead of incubating the puppies it'll incubate that bacteria and it just gets filled with pus and so each time that a bitch goes through a heat cycle without being bred the chances kind of increase especially if we if, if we get any sort of contamination and it, it can be there's two types of pyometra so there's an open pyometra and that'll be the dog that you know gets that infection and you see the pus coming out because her cervix is open and the pus is draining out and then a closed pyometra and that's when the cervix is closed like it is during incubation of puppies and the the bacteria just proliferate and multiply and that's that's where you can get those those uteruses that are just huge and full of pus um it can be a life-threatening emergency those dogs can get very very sick uh it's a it's a touchy surgery because you know you, especially if you get that one full of pus you're trying to manipulate it without rupturing it and spilling that pus into the abdomen and it 
puts a lot of te tension on the ovaries and the ligaments that attach the ovaries. And so it's, it's, it's not a fun surgery to do. Um, but it, it's basically just an entire pus filled uterus is what it is. Gotcha. What are your, what are your uh, thoughts on, um, uh, back to back breeding? So, you know, here again, I think as information changes in our profession, it used to be early in my career where that was, you know, totally a poo pooed thing, right? Like you're just a horrible person if you're breeding back to back breeders and you're just using the bitch to procreate puppies. And what we now know in kind of along the lines of Pyometra, right, is that the bitch wants to be bred. Like she wants to have puppies in her is, is part of that process. And so what I tell people is if that bitch handles pregnancy well, so a, a, a bitch that, you know, gets through weaning and is pretty decent body condition, those are dogs, like if, if we're going to breed them, let's breed them and then retire them for breeding versus prolonging their breeding career by doing, you know, one now, maybe one in two heat cycles, maybe one in two heat cycles. If, if we can keep her in good body condition, I think that the evidence shows that that back-to-back -back breedings is maybe a good thing and, and like, let's get the breedings out of the way and then retire her. Um, I'm not advocating, you know, let's get as many breedings as we can out of her, but facing them out, you know, if she handles the pregnancy and, and, uh, whelping and weaning good, I, I think there's nothing wrong with back-to-back -back breedings. It's probably in her best interest because we're doing it when she's younger than, you know, her body's prime for, for, uh, handling the puppies handling the pregnancy and so a lot depends on how that bitch handles pregnancy whelping and weaning if she's doing good then then i would breed her at a subsequent cycle gotcha gotcha um you deal with the canine athlete um what and more so hunting dogs is your thing sure so what kind of injuries do you see mostly and, and the reason why i'm asking is because we got guys in here just doing that boar hunting Mm -hmm. dogs running through thickets and things like that what what do uh, people need to watch out for and what kind of injuries do you normally see yeah so i you know i think the dogs doing that thing are going to be similar to dogs that, that that we see here um probably more so like a grouse dog up in in you know in the north woods versus out in the prairie here running through grass and things like that but you know i think probably lacerations are going to be high on that list right like they run into things and and, and get a cut um is is going to be probably my number one thing that we see i think the other things that that we see that people sometimes miss are eye injuries you know so whether that's debris in the eye or um you know cut to the surface of the eye those types of things and so you know my big thing when i get a dog out of the woods or out of the field is is doing a tailgate exam starting at the nose look at the eyes examine the feet examine up you know into the armpit areas the hidden areas and so a lot of these dogs can have nasty lacerations like in their armpit or their groin area uh that you that aren't bleeding and so unless you look you won't see it and for a long time in my practice you know before i started training people to to look for these things you know we'd get dogs that had been hunting you know saturday and sunday and then they get home with the family on monday or tuesday you know kids get home from school and the dog rolls over to get belly rubs and you know has this huge laceration that had probably been there for three or four days but because nobody bothered to look you, you couldn't see it and i think people assume you know you get a little paper cut and it bleeds like you're gonna die you know these dogs can just fillet themselves open and by the time we get back to the vehicle you, you, there's no blood, you know, it, it's not dripping blood. There's not a pool of blood. And so you really have to get your hands on the dog to look for these injuries a, a lot of times, because what happens is if we can address that injury right away, and that's where, where my course kind of comes in, right? Like if I can start addressing the healing process right when it happens, that dog's going to be so much further ahead than if I wait two or three days or, you know, get him into a vet on Monday when it happened on Saturday, you know, and, and sometimes that treatment is all that dog will need. And, and what we find here is, it gets those dogs back out in the field faster, right? So instead of a, a two week on the bench waiting for something to heal, if I treat that problem right away, maybe that next weekend I can be out doing what that dog loves. Um, I look at each hunting season or, you know, whatever you're, you're doing with your dog, each year of activity is about 10% of that dog's life, right? And so if I can keep that dog doing what it loves during its season, it's going to be able to to enjoy that life that much more and you're going to be able to you know do those things you enjoy with the dog that much more versus you know if i have an injury that didn't get addressed and that dog is on the the bench for a month or two that might be 10 percent of its productive life as far as doing that activity especially if we're talking short seasons our availability to do that so i'm really a proponent of getting dogs back out doing what they love 
not at the expense of, of further injury, right? So if you have a dog that has an obvious injury that needs to be addressed, um, say an orthopedic issue, that's, that's a different discussion than, you know, a skin laceration or a sprain or a strain that, that maybe we can work through. And, and, you know, it's, it's one that, that if we're not going to do damage, then, then let's get that dog back out doing what it loves to do is kind of what I advocate for. Gotcha. Let me ask you this. Um, what does, how do I word this? How important is the confirmation of a dog? hugely important functionality okay it's hugely important and i think i think the problem is is that we don't necessarily we don't necessarily have the information of what we've screwed up in a lot of these dogs mm -hmm. but what i can tell you is we've screwed up a lot of these dogs and so you know keeping it in my world you know i, I think cruciate ligament disease is probably uh uh one of the biggest problems that nobody really discusses how we're going to solve it. And so we have breeds that early in my crew, I never would have thought of, you know, that we'd have to deal with cruciate ligament disease in, and now we're seeing them. And, and my contention is, is it's how we as Americans change things, right? So I'm talking like, you know, uh, German wire hairs, German short hairs, English pointers, uh, German, uh, all these dogs that were just canine athletes that, you know, like I have setters in, in, um, I'll be honest, I, with those particular dogs I bought over the years, I wasn't anal about the breeders doing health clearances because they were breeding athletes to athletes that had longevity, right? And so I knew what I was getting and I knew what their breeding program was. And it was to produce functional dogs that could live a long career and be very, very active over the course of my career, that's changed. And so th those breeds that, that didn't have those problems now have those problems. And I think it's how we've chosen to breed them and what we've looked for in those dogs. And, you know, you start talking working dogs. I think the most extreme example is, you know, you take a look at what a functional German shepherd looked back, like back in the forties and fifties and look at a show German shepherd that is essentially a non-functional dog that can only move in a straight line because of the angulation of that, those rear legs. And, and, and there's your example of what we've done. And, and so the German Shepherd being the extreme example, but I think with a lot of these other breeds, we've done it inadvertently where we we've something that is pleasing to our eye isn't pleasing to the dog's function. And, and it's going to take, you know, like a, a, a biomechanist or somebody to, to step back and say, you know, what did these dogs look like that didn't have these problems compared to these dogs now that are having these problems? And like the cruciate ligament, for instance, we know that some of it's based on the, the, the tibial plateau and that's, you know, the surgery we used to, to fix cruciate ligament disease. We don't repair what the cruciate ligament was doing. We actually change the geometry of the leg and change the mechanics of the leg. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, what we may have to do someday in breeding is back that train up and, and undo what we've done to change some of that confirmation. We do know in certain breeds, there's a genetic component there, you know, Newfoundland's, uh, Labradors, they've identified a gene that, that contributes to it as well. And so, you know, I think it's a, it, the problem is, is it's multifactorial. And so instead of saying, you know, let's, let's chew up the elephant one bite at a time, we've just turned a blind eye and said, well, it's a fixable problem. And so let's just keep breeding these dogs. Mm, gotcha. So you said gene. So, um, we started to use a lot of Embark wisdom panel does do vets help these type companies come up with these health testing or that's a good question i i, I don't know I, I assume to a certain degree yes i think i think the problem with those those panels are is that they test for literally everything including sometimes diseases that aren't known to be in those breeds right and so like i had a uh a, a cocker breeder call me and, and he was you know in tears because his dog had a gene and it was a disease that's never been identified in cockers and i don't think you know that he had this sentinel case that you know we need to write a paper up and be like holy crap you know wisdom found this gene in this dog and so i think it's taking it a bit with a grain of salt i still feel like you know unknown diseases that were really trying to make sound breeding decisions I still prefer to send my stuff to the lab that developed those, you know? So like if I'm doing EIC testing, I still send it to the university of Minnesota where it was, where it was developed. If I'm looking at degenerative myelopathy, I'm still sending it to Missouri where the test was developed. Um, you know, some of the other diseases like UC San Diego for, for some of the myopathies and things, I, I feel like, because I question that too, you know, are, are they, 
outsourcing it to those laboratories or do they think they develop similar technology and, and they're just running with it? And I, I don't have a great answer uh, other than I also carry some of that skepticism. Like if, if, if I have someone that comes in with that and it's problematic, very likely I'd say, let's, let's send the test to this specific laboratory to, to confirm it. So I think it's a good general screening approach, but it, it's not a hill I would die on with my breeding program. Gotcha. Gotcha. Makes sense. So uh, I want you to go in on a subject that in my world isn't talked about enough, but I think it needs to be talked about. And that's the pad, how to care for it. What, what things should we do? When, how, how often should we look at it? I think all the time, you know, especially if you have an active dog, I think, you know, it's where the rubber meets the road. Right. So I think, you know, being conscious of what it looks like, I think it's also the area that we probably neglect the most in, especially like with training and conditioning programs, because what, what you, you get kind of suckered into, or I don't say suckered into, you, you get into a pattern, right? So you're training that dog on the same surface all the time. And so it's, it, it's feet get used to that surface. And, and it's, it's you, as soon as you have a change in surfaces where the problem develops. And so you might have a dog that you think has great pads, but then you change environments and they blow that pad out. And so I think it's being conscious of like little things and making sure that you're, you're running that dog on different surfaces. And so, you know, if all of your trains out in a grass yard, you know, finding some gravel, doing some things on cement, you know, doing some work where that dog has different contact so that, that irritating that pad in a way that that is is in a good way to to make it you know where it, it can perform i think the other thing is the starts and stops right and so even if the non-retrieving breed if we can get that dog to make quick you know retrieves where it's going to the right going to the left stopping and using those pads in a way um it, it's 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 i think it's a neglected area until it's problematic and so i think you know if you have a dog that's had pad issues in the past or foot issues having a program that I'm like, okay, I, I'm actually training and working on the pads right now. The, the place I'd give caution is asphalt, like asphalt will tear up a dog's pads, you know, quicker than, than anything, especially if you do retrieves on it. And like every summer, you know, we'll have the traveling family that they, they stop at a, you know, or at the motel and the dog's bored out of its mind. Cause it's been in the car all the time. So they throw a couple of quick retrieves, you know, or run the dog in the motel parking lot and just blows out all the pads and yeah. so you know i think you can use asphalt as part of that toughening program just don't go from grass to stop it on asphalt um and so i think it's i think it's variety uh, i'm not big on the uh, conditioning products so there's some of those products that will toughen the pad up i i think that they're they're you know kind of chemically abrasive that that cause hypertrophy of the pad um i I was in error in my thinking about things like Musher Secret and some of the other products that are available for once a pad's problematic uh, and that they're just like a wax type of product to help like, you know, to, to, to increase the, the, or decrease the friction. And so there are some of those wax based products, I think to help protect pads. So if you have a dog that like, you know, every time I do this certain thing, they have problems using some of those protective products, I think would be a good thing. Um, I'd always been skeptical of them in the past and, and until, you know, I looked into, I thought they were in that same category of, of, you know, changing the nature of the pad, but they're more of like a protective type of thing. I think those sort of things um, would be worthwhile using in a problematic dog. And so I think it, it's one that the pads get neglected a lot. Even, you know, I'll, I'll have dogs referred in for lamenesses that, you know, people assume are like a cruciate ligament issue or, you know, an elbow issue or things like that. And it's, it's just simply the pad, but we kind of skip it over, right? You go right to the big stuff and you forget that, like it all starts at those pads. And so being conscious of it, I think is super important. It gets way, way overlooked. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I know you're doing a first aid course, right? Correct. Uh, on the gun dog doc. I don't want to get into that because they can go over there and see that. I don't want to sure. take everything from your course. <laughs> but uh, one thing you mentioned was peroxide, peroxide and saline. Yep. And then a lot, a lot in our, in the dog world that we know is like use peroxide, everything. You got a scrape wound, use peroxide. Would you kind of straighten that out for yeah. us? Yeah. Yep. So absolutely not on the peroxide. Don't use it for wounds. Yeah. Don't use it. The only thing that I use peroxide for is to induce vomiting in a dog. And so it's, it's, um, and there's even some controversy now that, that, you know, emergency veterinarians and veterinarians are kind of anti-peroxide, um, because it can cause stomach upset and can cause stomach issues. I will tell you, especially if you're out in a remote area or you're away from a vet clinic, 
I still will use peroxide in my own dogs to induce vomiting if they get into something. And so, you know, growing up when you got a cut and your mom used peroxide and it bubbled, you know, that was the cure all for everything, right? That bubble in action was cleaning you know, everything out of there and was going to cure it all. What we know is that that bubbling action is actually causing microscopic damage at the tissue level. And so it's actually going to delay healing. And so I don't use it in any sort of wound situation at all. What I use a ton of is just straight saline. And so um, I, you go to the contact aisle in a, a pharmacy. It used to be that it was all saline with a few cleaners. Now it's all cleaners. And you have to really look for just the straight saline. Usually there's like the store brand and, and a Bausch and Lomb uh, are the only two SKUs that most pharmacies carry. And so just making sure that it's straight saline uh, eye wash. And I, I use that a ton. So I use it to flush the eyes. I use it to flush the nose. And that's my wound flush of, of choice. If you have a real dirty wound, then in my first aid kit, I'll also carry surgical soap or some sort of chlorhexidine type of solution to, to scrub. But it's it's really about flush, flush, and then flush some more using that saline um, is, is what I do. But definitely not peroxide for wounds. Gotcha. I'll tell you what. One thing I was surprised about is watching your content is how much stuff you pull out of dog nose. <laughs> 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 and that's so to your you know your point about your, your, the 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 boar dogs down there i i would have wager that probably happens more than you think down there as well right. it's those little bitty sticks and things like that that yeah it, it we end up with a lot of stuff up dogs noses especially mm -hmm. during hunting season up here so this year was it's kind of it was kind of ironic and maybe beneficial right because i I didn't really get into social media until like last September or October about the start of hunting season. And then, you know, you start pulling stuff out of dogs' noses weekly and it really increases your feed on Instagram. <laughs> it's like, damn, that was no. <laughs> the, the craziest part is, is that these dogs, you know, if it was you or me, like you'd be crying and telling everybody on earth that you got something up your nose, right? And like these dogs will continue to hunt and function normally. And so, it, it's 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 crazy how mild their symptoms can be carrying a stick up there and and i had a i had a setter once that um first year i moved to south dakota we opening season pheasant season and she ran down in a draw and just started sneezing blood i mean she was hemorrhaging everywhere and i was like son of a gun i'm sure she's got something up there i took her in the clinic and i couldn't see anything with scope because it was bleeding and it continued she continued having discharge for a couple of days and that was you know years ago when we didn't have a ct scanner here and so i had called uh, some colleagues down at Iowa State said, hey, do you think I need to do a CT to see if she's got a stick up there? I'm certain she does. And they're like, no, no, just do a, a month worth of antibiotics. And then if she's still having problems, come down. And she did great. So we were, my dad and I were out west hunting on a three-day hunt. She had pointed all kinds of birds. And I think it was the last day of antibiotics, last day of the hunt. And I went to get her out of, at the last spot. And she stepped out. And I thought she was going into a seizure. She was sneezing so hard. And she sneezed out about a three-inch stick that had been up there for a month you know and it, it, it hunted pointed birds acted like nothing was wrong and sneezed that dang thing out and i was just like man these dogs are incredible yeah they are they are um let's let's get into some more stuff well before we get out of this this uh uh era a matter we're doing right now since we going to going into the summer could we talk about some things Maybe we want to prep for for the summer, just some tips and some warning signs when our dogs might be in trouble. Yeah, so I, I think heat stroke is probably one of the things I'm most passionate about. And the reason for it is, is that it's 100% on us as handlers, right? Like we're responsible for keeping these dogs alive when it comes to heat. And, and they, you know, it, it, it's funny, I get asked a lot. I used to not, but in this era of social media, I get asked a lot about cold tolerance, right? I live in the northern part of the country and, and you know, you guys have had some cold snaps down there that aren't typical. And, you know, I, I'd see people freaking out about, you know, having their dog out in water when it's 32 degrees. And I mean, shoot, we're, we're hunting dogs, you know, when wind chills are below zero and, and you know, it's well below 32 degrees up here. And, and I feel like on that end of the spectrum with cold, a dog's just going to shut. A, a dog will tell you that, hey, I, this this isn't fun for me. And if you can read that, you know, I don't feel like we get dogs into too cold a weather and hypothermia in an observant handler just really isn't an issue. But I get asked about it a lot. The opposite is true with with heat stroke and with heat issues in that a, a dog will work itself right up to the state of killing itself. And, and if you can't recognize those signs, 
it can be too late by the time the dog's going to show you signs and they won't stop. I mean, a dog will literally kill itself with heat uh, and they're not, you know, it's not one of those things where like, boy, I'm hot. I need to take a rest like they will in the cold. And so I think it's being aware with your dog and, and it's, it's variable. You know, we talk about heat tolerance and, and, and there are dogs that are very heat tolerant. And they're dogs that are not heat tolerant. I've never owned a heat tolerant dog and I, and I hate it because it's on my mind this time of year, you know, like, uh, I didn't get my run in this morning. And so after we recording, I'm planning on going for a run and I sit here, it's, you know, I it was in the sixties when I woke up and I I've had this internal debate all morning, probably gonna be too hot to take the dogs, right? Probably too hot to take the dogs because I worry about heat stroke so much. Mm -hmm. What you're going to notice in a dog is that they, they really start panting so you get a dog that that's real active and running they pant heavily but this is a different kind of pant because it it's their way of cooling so instead of just a <laughs> it's a roaring type of thing like you can hear it in the back of their throat and they try to extend that tongue further out of their mouth and i think it's just to make as big an opening as possible and so you have that dog that you're used to seeing it you know run and pant with that tongue out and now suddenly that tongue seems like it's about a foot longer they really have their mouth open, trying to increase that airflow. The other thing that will happen is that tongue will get flat and wide because they're trying to increase the surface area of the tongue as much as possible. And so, you know, if you, if you really keep an eye on your dog, you can see like they'll, they'll have that tongue nice and narrow when they're, they're relaxed and, you know, into what they're doing, but warm, that tongue will stay nice and narrow, man. The minute they start getting hot, that tongue really broadens and flats out as they try to keep make surface area. The next thing that you're going to notice is, is ropey saliva because they're not taking the time to swallow their spit. And so they start getting that ropey saliva as we get further into the process, it starts drying out. So it gets that kind of that white cakey look. It'll hang from them where it just, they're not, they're not swallowing. So it's all just kind of dumping out uh, of the mouth. And then the, the step before we really get into trouble is I think these dogs get a glassy look on their, in their eyes and it starts looking like nobody's home or they look at you and it's like, Hey boss, I'm in trouble. And, and it's a definite change in that dog's demeanor. And if we get to that point, if we didn't recognize those first couple of points with the panting and things like that, you need to shut it down immediately and start right. cooling that dog. Um, it's, it's, it's like, you know, you guys, I think have it a little bit different cause you're hot more of the year. And so I yeah. think, you know, the dog conditioned to it more, you guys recognize it more where it's problematic in this part of the country we lose dogs to heat stroke every summer and then every fall as we enter hunting season because people aren't able to recognize those issues that occur with these dogs what's the best way to cool them down so i and that's been something that again i'm old enough that things have changed over time there was a period where you know people poo pooed having getting a dog wet or you know ice and now it's kind of come back in favor a little bit i think the big thing so i use ice in in ice blocks so if you know, typically like when i'm out hunting I'll, I'll have a cooler along with with you know stuff in it and have ice blocks or i'll carry a cooler specifically in case i, I need to cool a dog down the big thing is that you don't just want to put it on their trunk, right? So if you just put it on their back or on, on their chest, what sometimes happens and why ice was poo-pooed as a treatment is at that surface level, it can actually constrict the blood flow. And so it has the opposite mm. effect. And so you kind of can give these dogs, you know, essentially like what goosebumps are, right? So that, that you're, you're pulling the blood away, which is going to heat the dog up. And so I don't aim for those areas where I do is way up in the armpits, trying to get into those big pipes of, of blood vessels deep in the groin and then over the jugular vein. Oh. So when I'm using ice, I'm targeting where there's areas of big blood flow, hoping to basically cool the blood flow down, not trying to cool the dog down as much. And then I think getting a dog wet is important if you couple it with airflow. And so I think if you just get a dog wet and just leave them, sometimes that can actually cause problems and almost like it coats and, and insulates the dog, right? Versus if you make sure that, that that water gets down to the skin, and then I usually get them in the truck with the air conditioning blown on high over the top of them or some type of fan. The big thing you don't want to do is throw them in a crate. Cause that can be just like throwing them in a sauna, right? They're in their pant and create moisture and, and they can get that, that hotter. And so I've seen, you know, unfortunately a number of people where they act like that, that crate is going to be a magic box, right? Like you put this dog in with heat stroke and I'm going to open it up and the dog's going to be fine. Right. And oftentimes the opposite occurs. They open up to a dead dog as opposed to a dog that's now fine. And so getting oh. airflow, not putting that dog up until we know that that temperature is down to where it needs to be and that the dog is back in a safe, safe space. The thing I'd caution against is I've seen a lot of people advocate, oh, just getting them into water and, and water isn't always cool, you know, so we, we get you know shallow water and that can be like swimming in a hot tub. And so we'll have dogs that you, you try to cool them down in standing water 
and that might actually heat them up. And then the other thing that I've seen people, even if you send them into deeper cool water, you have this dog that's hot, mentally already having issues. And I've had dogs drowned from people trying to cool them down because they send them out to swim. And what's that dog doing when it's swimming? It's generating more heat and it, and it gets confused. And I've had dogs that, you know, we, that people were trying to cool down with heat stroke that ended up drowning because they got confused mm. and, and died. So standing water isn't always the answer. I think it's getting a dog wet with airflow, using ice and, and making sure we're actually going in the right direction with the thermometer and cooling that dog down. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Let's go into some nu nutrition. Now, you advocate a dog food. Is it called yuca banca? So, uh, yeah, it, it's, I, I, that's what I feed. You can nuba. Um, you can nuba, sorry. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's, it's one of the foods that I fed in the past as well. Um, I'm a big believer in the major manufacturers. And so, you know, I, I kind of the two I trumpet would be Yukonuba and Purina Pro Plan. Um, I know researchers on both of those teams. I think that they are producing products that they really have the longevity of our dogs in mind and that they, you know, want to help these dogs live as long of healthy as life as possible. And so I, I'm a big believer in those two companies. Okay. So, um, when you read in a dog food bag, could you kind of explain to people what are the main things you're looking for? So it, I will tell you, the dog food industry is unintentionally one of the most deceptive industries on the planet, I okay. think. And so it's very difficult to read a bag and tell the quality of that food. A lot has to be based on reputation and things like that. And so, um, you know, we were, we were talking before we jumped on about, you know, like chicken byproduct and stuff, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. chicken byproduct meal, it from one company can be a highly refined, very bioavailable, really good protein source. And so if they're taking that organ meat and they're processing it in, in a way that, that it's high protein, good bioavailability, chicken byproduct meal can be a great thing. From another company, it can be what you think of byproducts, right? It can be low quality, who knows what's ground up in there. The problem is on the bag, it's gonna say chicken byproduct meal. And I don't know if it's this good, the, the crappy stuff or if it's the good stuff. And so it, it's very difficult to just look at a bag and know the quality of ingredients that that you're um, you're getting. And that's where I think the thing that comes into hand is the the reputation of the company and the history of the company. And so a lot of the dog food industry is you're buying a marketing story, not necessarily science. And I think that that's the part that people, you know, miss is that so much of that dog food industry is, is, is based on marketing. So they're, they're telling you what you think you want to hear versus what we know and what the science shows. And so it, it's one that, that that's why I usually advocate to people, uh, am I buying science or am I buying a marketing story is the big, that's the place I start with when I'm evaluating a food. Um, you'll see in a lot of these boutique, you know, high end foods there, there, there used to be a formula and I think it's still probably on the market. Um, I won't name brands, but it was called the red meat formula. But if you looked at the ingredient list, it had like lentils and green lentils and crushed lentils and lentil flour and, and like ingredient splitting. Right. So it, it's one where if we actually probably added the ingredients up that we labeled different ways, it was probably a lentil for, formula as opposed to a red meat formula. And, and that's, you know, that's how corn got, you know, tagged as an evil ingredient is that back in the day, you know, the, the old feed mills would use, you know, corn and crushed corn and cracked corn. And, and it wasn't that corn was evil. It was just that it was a freaking corn formula that sucked for the dog, but people thought it was the corn that was causing the problem. And so, you know, what I've noticed, you know, with these higher end formulas is that they're going to use novel ingredients, but they're going to do that ingredient splitting which is what the cheap, you know, elevator formulas used to do, you know, back in the day. And so it's, it's understanding what you're actually buying. And, and so if I was looking at an ingredient label, those would be the things I'd look for, you know, is, is, you know, are, are beets on here three times, but in different forms, you know, or are we using a carbohydrate, but we're using it six or seven times. It, it, it's one of those sort of things that like, am I being deceived and marketed to, or am I actually buying a, a good formula? is where I would start with that process. And then knowing who's making the formula, I think too, the problem is, is that, you know, there's some of these small companies that they, they don't manufacture their own formula. And so, you know, there's some of these boutique formulas that will cast stone at other manufacturers and, and how they're made by that manufacturer, you know? And so it, it's, it's understanding, you know, the source of your food as well, that, that company that's telling you this heartwarming story, 
they might be made by a company that, you know, has been involved in every recall that we've had in the pet food industry. They just leave that part of their story out. And so it's, 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 I, I've been in and out of the, the consulting world for, you know, the last 20 years. And anytime I'm out of it for even more than 12 months, I have to call people and be like, who's making this, you know, I'll, I'll hear of a new formula or something becomes popular. And I have to call and be like, okay, who's making this formula? What's the story on it? Because, you know, even, even as somebody that's worked in the industry and is a veterinarian, like looking at bags or websites, it it's impossible to tell the quality of that product. Yeah. And there's been a lot of recalls lately. Ain't it? <laughs> Boy. Yep. yep. So what, Working dogs, what kind of food do you recommend for working dogs as far as like carbs? Uh... Yeah, so it, it 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 really depends on workload, right? And okay. so one of the things that, that I battle in the hunting dog world is that everybody wants to feed a performance formula because that they have a performance dog, right? And, and, and so a lot of these formulas I think are misnamed. Like we never should have called these performance formulas. Like that whole 30, 20 blend should have been called an endurance formula. It's meant for dogs that are working hard multiple days in a row. It, it, the food doesn't create the performance dog. You have a dog that does a certain activity and it's, it's giving the nutrition for that activity. Right. And so it's, it's one that, you know, if I have a dog that, that, you know, is working, you know, 30, 40 minutes a day and, and that's its workload, it, most adult maintenance foods are going to be fine. Right. And so it, it, it's one that I think it's, it's knowing your dog's workload. And so kind of the generic cutoff that I use is if a dog works for four days out of the week, hard for several hours a day, that's a dog that's going to need to be on, on, um, you know, a performance diet, like in that 30, 20 range, most other dogs are going to be fine on a good maintenance diet. I think the problem that occurs is that when people go to the other end of the spectrum where they, um, go into that novel kind of pet food market, or they get a novel ingredient is that sometimes they're cheating those dogs and they'll be low in fat and protein. And so making sure that we, you know, don't go too low on that stuff because we're feeding, you know, New Zealand crocodiles mixed with, you know, Norwegian birds, you know, where it's an expensive ingredient. So there's, they're not putting much in it, but they want to label it that. And that goes back to where am I buying science or am I buying marketing? And so, you know, some of your lamb based formulas, some of your fish based formulas sometimes will be a little bit too low in protein and fat. So just keep an eye that you're getting what you're paying for. All right. So in, uh, uh, my dogs, since I, uh, I breed, uh, central Asian shepherds and corsos, we always taught to grow the dog slow so will a maintenance food do that or is the main is a maintenance considered a large breed puppy food maybe it is it not and so so back in the day when we had two options one puppy formula and one maintenance food you would the, the maintenance food because it was lower in calories than like your traditional puppy food was a better option for those large breed dogs mm -hmm. i will say that in it that 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 fallacy continues to live. And I will say that that's probably one of the most detrimental fallacies that we still have that lives in, in, in the breeder world, in the performance dog world is, is that maintenance is a large breed puppy food and it's not. And so if, you know, I kind of touched on it earlier to me, the most important thing that you can do with a large breed puppy or with an athletic dog. So even if it's a 30 pound, five pound dog, is going to be an athlete is to grow that dog slow. And that's what those large breed growth formulas or large breed puppy formulas are designed for. So they address a couple of things. One is that they're lowering calories so that we're not over nutritioning those dogs. They have high quality proteins because we want to grow that dog. You know, we want, we want to, the building blocks to be good. So you want to have high quality proteins, but probably more importantly is that they're lower in calcium and vitamin D. And that's the part that people miss. And that's what your maintenance formula is not going to be restricted in calcium and vitamin D. And it's the calcium and laying those bones down and particularly the joints that's important for that slowed growth. And so, you know, finding those, those puppy, large breed puppy specific formulas, that's part of the equation, probably the most important part of the equation. And that's not addressed in those maintenance formulas. Those maintenance formulas are going to have too much calcium and that's where we're still going to have those orthopedic issues. And so I think with large breed dogs, with growing athletic dogs, probably the best thing that, that we we've had developed in, in the course of our lifetime 
are these large breed specific formulas and and that's the the stuff that can't be undone right so you know you have these great big dogs feeding them that out 18 24 months it, and they're going to get to that mature body weight right so a lot of people think well i don't want to you know i'm breeding these big muscular dogs or this big athletic dog i don't want it to be small and and that's another fallacy that people have it's not i'm going to shrink them it's just going to take them longer to get to that end point where the opposite can be true. And so, you know, you get these 120 pound Labradors that should be 75 pounds and, and they still look muscular and athletic. You can put too much fuel on that fire and the dog might not get fat while it's growing. But if, if, you know, we were supposed to get to 75 pounds and we get to 120 pounds, suddenly our body isn't what it was genetically designed for. Right. And that's where we're going to have some of those orthopedic issues, hip issues, knee issues. And it's just, just a dog that was bigger than it should have been. And so you can create too big a dog based on genetics. You're not going to, you're not going to, you know, unless you did something awful with your nutrition, you're not going to make a dog too small. You're just going to take it longer to get to that mature body weight. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I saw you uh, talking on raw dog food. Would you explain the dangers of raw dog food? Sure. So the, the, the big thing with the, a couple of things. So it used to be something I was pretty passionate about in the clinic advocating against. And I think the problem is, is that it's a couple of fold. So one is that most people don't have a diet that was actually developed by a nutritionist. You know, they found some internet or, you know, some dog breeder friend, or, you know, somebody at a trial, you know, said, Hey, this is what I'm feeding. And what happens typically is that the dog is selectively eating part of that diet, right? So it's not getting a balanced diet. It, 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 even if it was formulated, they're usually selecting out the tasty bits and leaving some of the other stuff. And so a lot of these dogs are not getting a balanced nutrition product. And so if I have clients that want to feed raw, what I ask them to do is if we can consult with a nutritionist to make sure that they're feeding a balanced diet, particularly with the micronutrients, right? So we start talking about the vitamins, the minerals and things like that, because over mm -hmm. time, those things can be very, very important. Um, and so th that's point one is I think most people are not feeding a balanced diet when they go the home cooked or raw route. The other big factor is with raw diets is bacterial contamination, both for the dog itself, but for the humans involved in the environment. Um, and so going back to your question on, on antibiotics, one of the places that we've actually seen antibiotic resistant bacteria is in the feces of dogs fed a raw diet. And so it's not coming from, from them, but from the cattle and different things like that. So wow. it is something that, that, you know, it's, it's, it's an area that we're ever increasing our knowledge. And most of the things that we know about feeding raw is that they come with these other risks, not necessarily all health related to the dogs, but global risks for, for us as well, in that there are no studies to show that there's any benefit to that. And so I think that, that the other part of it is, is you know, everybody, assumes that that if i feed my dog that way there's going to be increased health benefits and, and and again i think if we go back to what the major manufacturers are doing they're wanting to produce a formula that these dogs are going to live for a long period of time and and i think we see that like the 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 age of these dogs has increased i should tell you for myself I, i'm a pretty clean eater and there was a period in my time uh, when i was doing marathons and triathlons that like i was basically a locavore i was you know farmers market vegetables proteins that i acquired like i, I believe in that clean mindset and 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 you know healthy eating sort of behaviors and so if i felt like there was a solution for my dogs that was the best I, i'd be the first one out there trumpeting it because i want these dogs i want my dogs to live forever and so it would be a selfish endeavor you know like that what the evidence shows is what i'm going to do and i think right now the evidence shows that that feeding these well-balanced formulas is going to be the, what's in the best interest of our dogs that may change just like our discussion on spay and neuter right like things change over time i just think as humans we're really reluctant to embrace change and, and accept new information um and that may happen in the food world right now i think the major manufacturers have the best evidence that they're doing what's best for these dogs gotcha gotcha okay um i saw you covering this somewhere else but i wanted my audience to hear this you you stated on another podcast that you had a dog that was 15 years old still hunting yep at, at the time that would have been her yep yeah yeah so and, and to, so to my point like my household i i can't use it as an you know like it's not a study right but like mm -hmm. so Belle lived to 16 and a half at 15 she still hunted so in her 16th season 
uh, I actually still have a freezer full of birds that, that I shot that year because I assumed it was going to be her last year, right? Like how many 15 year old dogs are out making it happen. And so every bird I shot, I kept because I was like, well, I got to mount this bird. It's going to be your last bird. And she hunted like a seven year old dog. And so a lot of it had to do, I think with nutrition activity, keeping her thin, um, Lily lived to 14. My, the, my wife's dog that I talked about, uh, is 16 going on 16 and a half. We had a 22 year old cat. Um, all of my dogs have been very active into early teens. And so my cocker who I lost the same year that I lost, uh, bell was 14. And, and I'd actually had her out snow goose hunting a couple of weeks before she passed away. And so it, it's one that I think, you know, it's keeping them thin on good nutrition, you know, everybody wants to ask, how can you avoid the veterinarian, right? Like mm -hmm. that cost have gone through the roof. And, 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 you know, my wife and I joke all the time that we're glad we don't own a clinic any longer because I just don't think I could stomach charging the prices that that's charged right now. It's, it's, wow. it's, you know, compared to mo you know, everything in the world has gone up, you know, it's, it's, it's one that, you know, I stopped at, uh, Jimmy John's to grab a sandwich and I about fell over when, you know, they told me the price for a sandwich and a drink, uh, mm -hmm. But all of that. And so people want to know how they avoid seeing us. And to me, it's keeping the dog thin and feeding the good food. And and, and very likely, you're going to really limit your vet visits with those two things. Right, right. And you also, I saw somewhere uh, you was talking about how accurate are dog years? As far as like seven sure. years being what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I, and so there, there is a new formula out there and you, I'd have to Google it. I don't, where they, they, you know, after a couple of years, based on the dog side, the size, they use a different factor where we think that, you know, the big dogs probably, you know, it's, it's more than that. Like each year is more than seven where some of these little dogs, it's less than that. I think, I think we're entering a time again, talking about new information where, whether it's dogs or whether it's us so much of aging, I think becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy more than it is an actual thing. And so, you know, I think what we're finding is when we stop using things, they go away. And so whether that's our brain and, you know, you, you, you retire and you stop doing things, you, how many people do you know that die shortly after retirement? Right? right. And I think you disengage from something and the body says, well, I'm used up and done. So let's age versus if you say, you know what, like right now I have all kinds of aches and pains. Like my, my hour before bed is now with a foam roller and a, a lacrosse ball working out mm -hmm. aches and pains, mm -hmm. but I'm not giving up. Right. And so it's, it's one staying mentally stimulated, staying physically stimulated, I think is what it's important. And so one of my pet peeves is, you know, I'll have guys come in with 10 year old dogs and be like, well, we're going to retire him this year because he's 10 and it'll be this perfect physical specimen of a dog. I'm like, well, why are we talking retirement? Well, because he's 10, he hit an age, right? We hit retirement age. We hit, and, and I think that, the, you know, the big thing is to, to age is a number and we don't, there's no, you know, diseases come with age, but age in and of itself is not a disease. And so I think it's, it's not having that mindset that, oh, we're at this age. So now the wheels are going to come off because I, I do think we cause that, you know, it's, it's one that, um, in my world, I see a lot of misdiagnosed hip dysplasia, right? Like you have that dog that gets older and starts having trouble getting up and, and we say, oh, it's hip dysplasia. Here's your anti-inflammatories. And then the dog gets worse and we say, oh, it's a good thing we didn't hunt old, you know, red because look at how bad he is sitting on the couch there. And, and it's actually just intervertebral disc disease. You know, we all, as we age, have back issues and, and these dogs do as well. And so if we treat the problem, that dog can still have a, a very fine athletic career but we have to treat the correct and address the correct problem. And so what happens is, is as a dog ages, there's more maintenance things that maybe have to happen that didn't have to happen when it was in his athletic prime. But I think that the end result of performance and activity, um, can still be there if, if we adequately take care of them. Uh, and I'm not talking, you know, that you have to baby them and it's, you know, you're doing it just because, and that was Bell in her, in, at age 16. So I still took her out. 16, it was purely ceremonial. So she went with us. She wanted to go in the truck. I'd set her down on the ground at a hunting spot and, and there was no hunting when she was 16 years of age. That was right. more for her mental health than anything, Right. but, but used to that. So it's a long blithering answer to, I hate numbers because I think we get tied up in numbers in, in whether it's age, whether it's blood values, whether it's, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things like we want to assign value to something and, and not treat or lick, live with what's in front of us. And so I think that, you know, like with aging dogs, 
I think if we let them age, they will. If we treat them like they're a young dog, keep them active and, 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 and feed them accordingly, a lot of these dogs can, you know, into to mid double digits have pretty productive, active lives. Gotcha. Okay. Excellent. Um, how could breeders, I want you to talk to breeders. What can we, what things that we can do better for our dogs, for vets, for families? What, is there any measures we can take to do this a lot better than what some of us are doing? <laughs> Probably a couple things I'd say. I think one is on the health front, you know, being aware of health problems that occur within your, your particular breed, right. And not having kennel blindness to that. And I think, you know, it's, it's one I've never bred I, every dog I've, I've bought. I thought, well, maybe I should breed a litter. Cause I, I used to do a lot of breeding work and, and it's part of, you know, having that expertise as like, I probably should at some point in time, whelp and raise my own litter so I could have it. I, I think you have to be a little bit cold as a breeder to make correct decisions. And I think that too often people get a dog, whether that's, you know, a dog, they import it, they spent a lot of money on it as a puppy and they want to make the decision that that's going to be a breeding dog. Like the minute they sign that check, mm -hmm. as opposed to understanding what they have when that dog is a little bit older and, and actually breeding to improve the breed or if you have a specimen that is the epitome of what the breed should be and so i think it's being more critical of your own program which is very tough as humans it, you know it's kind of the self-fulfilling prophecy right like if i invest all this time and money on this puppy i sure as heck think i have to breed it later in life and being able to say you know what maybe i'm not going to breed this dog and and, and maybe flipping that around and be like this dog's got to prove to me that it's going to enter my breeding program as opposed to the minute it hits my kennel, it's in my breeding program. And, and, and I see that all over the place. I think when choosing dogs to breed to, the same thing has to apply. You know, like I deal with a lot of hunting dogs. We have a lot of hunting dogs right here, right? Like there's dogs in the upper Midwest that these people could go and visit that dog and evaluate this dog. But instead, what do they do? They get on somebody's flashy website from, you know, South Florida and think, oh, that's the dog, you know, breeding paper I hate is, is, you know, I, I just, I hate breeding paper. I want to make sure that like I'm evaluating the dogs that I'm breeding so I know what, what I'm producing. And so I would get out of that habit of breeding paper. Like, yes, the paper's important in, in certain qualifications, the health clearances and things like that but, but knowing the dogs that you're producing and breeding. And so I think it, it's one, I don't want this to sound cold, but I think, you know, if, if we would approach dog breeding, not how we treat the animals, but approach our decisions more like the livestock industry, you know, and, and so, you know, are we producing good offspring is what, did the bitch have a good time, you know, easy time whelping? Did we, you know, make these clinical decisions about how we're developing our breeding program and remove some of the emotion, I, I think would be a huge thing. And I think it would increase our, our, the, the health of the dogs, right? If we were making these decisions because it's what was best from a health standpoint, from a decision standpoint versus so many dog breeding decisions are based on emotion and, and it made before a dog ever gets to the point to prove whether it should be bred or not. I, I have clients come in all the time that, you know, eight week old puppy, Oh, I can't wait to breed this dog. <laughs> yeah. it, it just drives me insane. It drives right. me insane. Yeah. They don't know how heartbreaking it really is. Cause you have to remove a dog from a program because you just can't exactly and that's you know you're going to compound the problem you know if it's a trait that's there and you uh breed it it's going to come back out in the puppies exactly and, and and that's you know we go back to my setter breeder they they um they also had red setters so they had english setters and red setters and and they had a dog that was a wash out of their breeding program that a friend of mine ended up with and she took that dog to be a versatile the first red setter versatile champion in the NABDA hunting world. So, you know, a dog that they considered to be a washout ended up to be the first in breed history to get to a certain point, but they were critical enough to know, you know, like that dog was a great dog and probably the best dog that that friend will ever own, but it didn't fit with what they were trying to do with their breeding program. And I think, you know, back in the day, 20 or 30 years ago, everybody thought, you know, calling meant whacking the dog over the head or, you know, ending its life to remove it from the breeding program. And that's not the case today, right? There's so many people that just want a good pet dog of a certain breed that you can remove that dog from your breeding program. It ends up in a great loving home that ha have a great life. 
but it isn't causing you problems down the road. And so I think, I, I think getting more critical of your breeding program would be the thing that I would suggest most in, in, as you get smaller genetic pools, that becomes even more difficult, right? Because you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so, you know, if you only have a handful of dogs that you're dealing with in the country, you may have to make a poor decision to make a better decision down the road. And that's the part that some people also have trouble getting around where this litter, I may have the number of puppies that like, not that you don't want your name around it, but that you're you're producing to go to pet homes in order to get maybe these two or three puppies that are then going to enter into the breeding program and things like that. And, and that's where I, I just, I don't have the stomach to make those cold decisions, but that's, I, I buy my puppies from people that are able to make those kind of clinical and cold decisions. Um, I, I think that's the, probably the biggest problem in the breeding world is people get kennel blindness and stop making critical decisions and, and make their breeding decisions based on emotion. And you can't answer it better than that um behavior wise uh training methods i know you you're a dog man you hunt you're you're veterinarian canine you all it yep uh with your dogs per se or dogs in general the the traditional training yankee crank hard corrections do you think it's necessary as much today as it used to be as I don't. And, and that's, and then again, I think that's something that's kind of come pretty full circle, um, particularly like as I, even within the hunting dog space, I think that you have people that are different places along that curve of learning, like, how can we get the best out of these dogs? You know, and, and, and I grew up at a time early in electronic collars where, you know, everything was, you know, turning pressure off and, and, you know, making a dog uncomfortable to perform as opposed to, you know, making a dog want to perform. I think that there's probably places that we've taken that too far the other way, you know, in whether it's dogs or raising kids where, you know, everything has to be, you know, so soft and, and reward based. I think there's a middle ground there, right. Where I, I think you can naturally kind of bring these dogs along. Um, the, the kind of the eye opening experience for me was when I, when I got my cocker puppy, he, it, she was from a, a British trainer, a, a guy that came over from England and I went and spent some time with him and it was probably the most incredible dog time that I've ever spent with a human being. And so we went out with a pack of dogs on a run and this guy, no collars, no corrective measures at all. And like never raised his voice, like him going, ah, 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 would have been like, you know, another trainer cranking the collar up to a hundred and lighten that dog up. The, you know, the dog was like, Oh my God, I screwed up. And all he did was go, ah, 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 ah. And like, he would stop and those dogs would be so responsive and listen and like crisp and fast and all the things that I was taught you could only get with pressure. He was clearly getting them without pressure. And it wasn't, you know, he wasn't carrying a basket full of treats and, you know, it wasn't clicker or reward. Like it wasn't to the other extreme. It was that he was connected with the dog and, and made its learning process very clear. And I think that that's the part, you know, we're in this, this push button society where we want everything instantly, right? Like it needs to happen in instant and you know i want my disease cured in less than two weeks and i want an answer in 30 seconds because i texted you um and, and dogs aren't that way right so it, it has to be a program for that individual dog and so it, it's and i'm not anti-electric collars so i also i run my dogs with electric collars because i feel like it's the ultimate safety measure right like i'd hate to have my dog you know, chasing a jackrabbit towards a highway and ignoring my whistles and i don't you know i have the tool but i chose not to use it you know, because of some belief system. And so I, I do run my dogs with uh, electric collars. I think they totally have their place, but I think it's that it's not shortcutting the the training. And I think too many people in, in so many force programs are based on, it's basically shortcutting training versus making sure the dog understands what you want out of it. So I, I, I have over the course of my career kind of changed that, you know, I grew up in a time again, where it was more force based. And now, you know, I think it, I think it's understanding the dog and having them learn adequately. And I think that's a we miss is the adequate part. We think they have it learned, you know, it just, just like our discussion on pads, right. But you got to change environments, right. That dog might be perfect here, mm -hmm. but it's not perfect here because I never trained there. And so it's, it's, it's making sure you're actually training the dog and not just using force as a, as a crutch to get you to that end point quicker. Right, right. Yeah, uh, and that's and that's funny because like uh we got a lot of protection dogs, uh guys in uh that follow this channel. And one thing some of the bet the better ones always uh focus on bonding. 
with the dog. And that's that's really, really major. So uh I think that's it. I think that I think I got them all uh out <laughs> with you. Uh is there uh anything you like to close with? Uh I know people would like to follow you and know where to do all this at. Yeah, so um, the website is gundogdoc.com. Uh, I'm probably most active on Instagram, and that's at gundogdoc. Um, no, I just, I just appreciate the opportunity. I think it, it's it's this, right? Having these discussions, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're working as dog owners and veterinarians. You know, part of what I'm trying to do is I, I'm at a space in life where I have the time to, to kind of do this. I think as a profession, you know, to your point about looking for breeder-friendly vets, is you know we were a profession that was so trusted so customer service oriented you know we cared about the pets but also the owners and you know the shift was happening pre-pandemic but then the pandemic hit everybody got an animal and vets suddenly became overworked undervalued and customer service has kind of gone out the door um i'd like to bring that back to 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 you know veterinary medicine that we we are most of us are a caring profession that you know wants you to have a good experience with your dog your dog to live the healthiest life possible but until we have these conversations it, it doesn't feel that way right like it's just right. it it's you know oh he's a breeder or oh he's you know into protection dogs or oh it's a you know i don't want to see another hunting dog owner because of this that or the other thing like we don't even get to that point of sitting down and having these conversations where at the end of the day, we have a lot in common, right? Because mm -hmm. most dog people are good people. And, and, mm -hmm. you know, you get down to that core value of it. It's, it's getting back to that point where it's always amazing to me that veterinarians would, you know, have an anti vision towards breeders be like they're producing our patients, right? Like it's the craziest thing in the world. Like yeah. I hate the people that are producing my clients. And so like that alone just blows my mind. And so it's, it's, right. it's bridging that gap again, where like, we are a caring profession and it is we want the best for dog owners it really does start with breeders because they're producing yeah. puppies yep yep so that's why uh i'm so glad you came over here uh because we need more uh you know people that's certified went to school for it live it like guys like you uh to come over here and talk to us because we definitely need you. We got to go see you anyway. Exactly. <laughs> you know happy, I mean? happy to sit down and chat anytime. Okay. Okay. Cool. Man, I, I appreciate this. Uh, Y'all be sure to go follow Dr. Joe Spoo, the gun dog doc is in the house. So y'all go follow him. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And that wraps up another episode of NWA Connie Corsos. Thank you for being a part of our Connie Corso community. Remember, you can stay connected with us beyond the podcast. Find us on all major media platforms by searching for NWA Connie Corsos. Whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube, just hit that follow button to join the conversation and get the latest updates. If you have a burning question or want to apply to be a guest on our show, we'd love to hear from you. Simply shoot us an email at nwaconniecorsos at gmail.com. And if you're a business interested in becoming a sponsor, reach out to us at the same email address. For more resources, exclusive content, and links to all our social media profiles, visit our website at nwaconnycorsos.com. It's your go-to destination for everything dogs. Thank you once again for tuning in, and we can't wait to bring you more exciting episodes where we explore the fascinating world of dogs.